would you turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, if you haven't already? We're going to be in Mark chapter 6, looking at verses 45 to 52. And so Jesus and his disciples are full into the mission now, and Jesus has been ongoing in his ministry where he is preaching the gospel of the kingdom and performing various miracles. And because of this, we've seen a variety of responses, uh, many coming to faith and trusting in him, as well as many that are in opposition to him, some thinking he's crazy, some thinking that he's possessed. Um, And then we even saw in his hometown or his home country, Nazareth, uh, they were offended at him. And after that moment, we see that Jesus begins to send his disciples out two by two, and they went on mission around the, the region, and they were able to do exactly what Jesus did. They were able to s- preach the same messages and the, the parables they'd already heard, as well as they were able to heal the sick and um, exercise demons, and they had the same power and authority that Jesus had when they were going on mission. And last week what we saw, if you remember, um, the disciples had returned, and what they did is they were giving Jesus a full report of everything that they were able to do, and probably everything they, they saw, um, the conversations they had. I'm sure that, you know, you've heard people come back from a mission trip before where they're excited about some of the um, exciting things that God has been doing in their midst, um, and I can just imagine Jesus overjoyed probably hearing their excitement for the things of the kingdom as they're talking about all the things they were able to do. And so, but Jesus, after he hears what they've been doing, he then uh, encourages them and says, come on, let's go to a deserted place. Um, There's so many people coming around this area. We're not able to really get any rest or even really get a meal in. So let's get the boat and let's um, get to a deserted place and there we'll rest. And about that same time, many people see their boat. And so many people from the surrounding villages flock to where they go. And so by the time they get there, there are already multitudes there. Actually, we see in the text that it says at least 5,000 men were there. And at this point, we see how through the, this miracle that he performs there, which is referred to as the, the feeding of the 5,000, we see really so many great things about our Lord and Savior. We see the compassion of Christ. We saw that when he looked at them, he wasn't annoyed. He wasn't like, oh, we're exhausted. We don't have time for you. Rather, he had compassion, and he said that basically they were like sheep without a shepherd, and so he wanted to be the good shepherd to them. So we saw the compassion of Christ. We also saw the provision of Christ, how he was able to provide for every single person there, and that he wanted to meet their needs, which I think obviously points to the deepest need we all have, which is what he was doing when he was there, was teaching them. He didn't just give them physical food, but he also had been giving them spiritual food all day. And then finally, we see that after he gave all of them food, they were satisfied. And that shows uh, or speaks to the satisfaction that we find in Christ. So you see the compassion of Christ, the provision of Christ, and the satisfaction we find in Christ. And it's so important that we kind of remember that and keep that in our minds as we move then to this section of text tonight, because we're going to see at the very end of this story is kind of a, a warning for the church. Because they should have remembered what Jesus had just done as they were moving into this storm. And you'll actually notice this is the second storm that the disciples have found themselves just in the Gospel of Mark. We know that already they were in a storm with Jesus. And Jesus, remember, he was asleep. He had his head on a pillow and, you know, was out. And they were freaking out and asking, do you even care about us? We're perishing. And then they woke up Jesus and Jesus was able to still the storm. Well, they're going to find themselves again now, because at the end of the miracle, after he's been teaching all day, he then feeds everyone, he feeds the 5,000 plus people. What we then see is he he tells the disciples, that what we're going to read tonight, he's going to send the disciples into a boat as he's dismissing the crowd. And we're going to find them in this storm, and we're going to see why it's so important that we remember the lessons from the feeding of the 5,000. So, um, that being said, let's turn to the text tonight. And we'll read it, verses 45 to 52. It says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. 
Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. So that's where we will stop in the reading this evening. And so, as I said, Jesus has just performed the miracle feeding the 5,000, and now he tells his disciples to get in a boat and to go to the other side. So they're going in the boat, they're going to go without Jesus, and Jesus is going to meet them later. And while he's doing that, he's starting to dismiss the crowd. And what we find later in John's gospel is we find out kind of what's going on in that story. And I'll actually read the text for us in a little bit. But what was going on is Jesus could perceive that the crowds were wanting to make him king. And they were wanting to force him to basically go and start to overthrow Rome because they saw his power. They knew that he could, he could do it. And Jesus knew that it wasn't his time. And this wasn't the way. He wasn't going to take Rome by force. Rather, he was going to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And so, because of that, he sends his disciples away, and he starts to dismiss them. And then what we see in the text is that Jesus goes to the mountain. So he's on dry land on a mountain, and then they are in a boat in the water. So you can really feel the contrast of where they're at. And it's really a good reminder than thinking back to the other story where they had Jesus in the boat. So now it's Jesus is not in the boat, right? So he's on the land, they're in the boat, and you're starting to see them become weary again. They start to become a little freaked out, and as the wind is contrary to them, it says in the text. And so as they're out, and it says that they've been rowing for hours. So this um, would have taken some time to get there anyway, but it had become so much longer because of the weather. And so it says that around the time of the fourth watch, which that would have been around 3 to 6 a.m., so there were certain watch periods of time. So think about this. This is probably the darkest part of the night. So, you know, 3 to 4 a.m., maybe somewhere like that. Um, It says at that point, Jesus sees them from the dry land, and he goes to them. And then it says as he goes there, he starts to walk by them. And I don't think we should read that as thinking he was planning on ignoring them. He was going to them. But I think it was he was wanting them to see him for who he was and to recognize him. But rather, when they see Jesus, they get more terrified. Rather than be comforted from the fact that Jesus is now there, they think, oh, it's a ghost. And uh, we don't know exactly why they immediately think it's a ghost. Um, There is some um, teaching that thought that there was um, contemporary ideas that that people that had died um, in the water, like if you had been traveling on a ship or a boat and there was a storm and you died there, that maybe your spirit kind of um, stayed in that area. So it could have been maybe the ghosts of those who had fallen or died um, traveling in the waters. Um, some have suggested maybe it was a, they were fearing it was something demonic or something, a spiritual force that was evil or some sort. But we don't know exactly. All we know is they are terrified when they see Jesus and they think that he is a spirit or a ghost of some sort. And then what Jesus does is he comforts them with his words, and he tells them to be of good cheer, to not be afraid, and he says, it is I. And then at that point, we see he goes and moves to the boat, and the wind ceases. And you might be wondering, well, wait, I thought that there was a point where when Jesus is walking on the water, that Peter looks to him and says, call me to come to you if it is you, and I will you know, step out of the boat, and we see that in exchange where Peter sees the, the wind and the waves, and he starts to doubt, and then he sinks, and then Jesus saves him and, and pulls him out and says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I'm sure many of us are familiar with that. Well, what's interesting is we don't get that part mentioned at all in the Gospel of Mark. We don't know why that is, but there is a thought that because Mark is most likely the scribe for the Apostle Peter, and the Gospel of Mark is really like the Gospel according to Peter, it could be out of humility that Peter didn't want to include him walking on the water. 
which would be a really interesting thought to think that Peter didn't want to include that because, and I know sometimes people are hard on Peter because Peter ended up sinking, but just to think, and we already know what other denominations and people can do with Peter where they elevate him too highly, um, but really when we think about it, how amazing this is. Apart from Christ, no other human being has ever been able to walk on water. But because Peter had faith in Jesus, and he was willing to take that step of faith outside of the boat, he was able to walk on the water. But as I said, for whatever reason, whether you think it's plausible that maybe he didn't want Mark to include it, um, or there's another reason for um, Mark's um, style of writing that he didn't include it, we don't know. Um, But it is interesting that he didn't include that. But then the story doesn't end with Jesus getting in the boat and the wind ceasing. Rather, we see this final thing, if you see in verse 52, or actually well, in v- verse 51, you see how they're amazed in, um, and in themselves and beyond measure and marveled. But then in verse 52, it says, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. So what we see here is that there was something going on in their hearts as the disciples. There was an issue there, actually, which Mark includes this where the other Gospels don't all give us this information about their heart condition. But there was something going on with the disciples that they hadn't learned the lesson of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 as they come to this point where they're in another storm initially without Jesus So as we think about this story, um, the first thing that I think that we can draw from the text is that I think it's clear that obedience can be uncomfortable at times. You know, we talked already in the past, the the first time we looked at a storm that the disciples found themselves in, is that storms are inevitable. And we find ourselves that there are those storms of correction where you're in rebellion and God needs to put you back on course. And there are those, the storms of perfection, the storms that when you are being obedient, that God will use them to, to make you more and more like him, that you would grow in your faith, grow in holiness. And I think that's what, what we're seeing here in the text for these individuals. I think the, they have been obedient. They've been following Jesus. They've been hearing what he did whenever he's been asking them what to do with the feeding of the 5,000. They were, they were doing exactly what Jesus told them to. And then he says, get in the boat. And now they're obeying once again. But we find that even with obedience, and maybe I would even add oftentimes with obedience, comes discomfort. If your Christianity is always comfortable then you might need to re-examine your Christianity. Why do I say that? Well, Christ constantly is calling his disciples outside of their comfort zone. If you remember the story or the, the, the account in Luke 9, where you have three different times where people are saying that they want to follow Jesus, or Jesus says, follow me. And then there's these excuses. And what we find is that Jesus is telling them that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head at night. You might have to be willing to be homeless to follow me. He says, let the dead bury their dead. He says, sometimes you have to be willing to risk relationships for following Christ. He says, no, you, know, you can't go back and say goodbye to your, to your family. You have to be able to go with me. We know he says, you must take up your cross, deny yourself daily, and follow me. It's constantly this pattern of discipleship is we must be willing to sacrifice Give up our comforts, our things that we are um, used to, that, you know, the normal things of life, and we must be willing to go wherever and do whatever Christ calls us to. And I think that sometimes, especially in the American church, we, we like it, or we can maybe agree with it whenever it's preached, but whenever it really comes down to the practical living, we like comfort. We really like it. And the fact is, we know that when we're in a church, and if it stops being too comfortable for us, a lot of times people leave. You know, if people hold you accountable, call you out on a sin in love even, we're just going to go to another church. Or if they're not doing it, exa- if there's one little thing that bothers me in the church, then I might leave. Or just in our general, you know, matters of life and faith. How many times when there's just a minor inconvenience that happens in your life, not a major thing, just a minor inconvenience, how much it can just wreck your day. It can, it can just change your mood altogether. Why is that? It's because we are so addicted to comfort. Think about it. We can actually be addicted to comfort. But once again, Christ is calling us to die to those things and realize that it requires sacrifice. Sacrifice is not comfortable. 
right? Sacrifice is something that we have to do that we don't normally wouldn't probably do in ourselves. A lot of us like to make our paycheck and get home with our families and relax. Now, you can do that, of course, but that it can't be your entire Christian walk. And once again, this, there's balance here, of course, because we know that Christ does give us comfort, and we can find true contentment in Christ. But we need to have this theological balance, I think, spiritually, of understanding in Christ we can find true contentment, true comfort, but we also can't be addicted to comfort. We can't let comfort drive our decisions. We have to allow obedience to override all things and know that when we obey, you're going to find yourself in storms. When you obey, you're going to find problems in your life. You're going to see that the enemy is actually going to put a target on your back because when you are faithful, that's exactly what the enemy doesn't want. So you'll notice there will be these things that will happen. And so what we should do then is recognize spiritual blessings are a good thing that God gives us. And we want to receive them, but we want to do it balanced with also embracing the times where we experience burdens or battles because we don't want to be pampered children. We want to be mature sons and daughters. And once again, I think that's exactly what Christ is doing here because if you noticed in the text, it says in verse 45, who is the one that sent them on this journey? Jesus, right? It says immediately he, that is Christ, made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida. And that word made is literally compelled. He's like, you're going to go. You're going to go in this boat. And I think that Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen that night. I think he knew that they were going to find themselves in another storm, experiencing fear and doubt, and he was wanting to build on their faith. And as I had already mentioned, because Jesus already knew what the crowds were doing. He knew that many of the crowd was starting to talk about, hey, this might be a prophet or he, we, we could make him king. And so I want to read this for you in John 6, verses 14 to 15, and then think about it of what maybe Jesus was thinking about for his disciples. So it says, then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. So Jesus obviously knew it wasn't his time. And there was probably even a satanic temptation there once again about trying to take the crown before the cross because that's what the devil already tried to do in the wilderness. He wanted Jesus to rule but not go to the cross if he would just worship the devil and take the nations, basically. We see another temptation there, I think. But think about this from the disciples' perspective. They see ministries going great. Thousands of people just saw Jesus perform a miracle. Now think about what they were probably thinking in their minds. Oh, this is the moment. We're going to do exactly what the crowd was wanting to do. We're going to take over Rome. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the political figure, the king that we've been hoping for. And maybe tonight what we're going to do is we're going to go to the villages with these people that are here, and we're going to go to the wealthy houses because there's probably some wealthy people that were there in the audience. And we're going to go and, and we're going to eat with them, dine with them, and maybe we're going to collect an offering. And maybe we're going to get nice places to live, and you know we're going to be at his right hand and his left hand, and we're going to rule and reign here on the earth right now. Think of, I'm not saying that everyone, all of them were thinking that, but surely that would be a temptation. Ministry is going great. Let's stay right where the ministry is going great. Not, let's not leave and go to another place and, and potentially go through a storm. You know, they, they were wanting probably what many of us like. Ministry is going great. Let's stay right where it's comfortable. Let's not leave here. Let's capitalize on the moment where Jesus actually says, no, you're going to leave. And so it's interesting, I think, that where Jesus, he may sometimes call us to do that. It, it might be seeming like life is going perfect exactly the way it is, but he still might call you to get out of your comfort zone or change up everything in your life, your pattern, your routine, your job. You know, there's so many things. And I think that's what we kind of can learn here because I think Jesus sensed this potential danger that may have had an effect on the disciples, the desire to make him the king right then and there. So I think that's the first thing that we can see is that obedience can be uncomfortable at times, and we have to be willing to embrace those moments of discomfort. The next thing I think we can see is that Jesus is just amazing. It's just as we think about this story, we think about the two miracles, what we see though in this story specifically is that Jesus prays for us, sees us, and shows up for us. 
We see that all in this miracle. Jesus prays for us, sees us, and shows up for us. In verses 46 and 47, it says this, And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. So right away we see Jesus prioritizing once again getting away and praying to the Father. Private prayer was always a priority to Christ. We already read in Mark's gospel earlier, in Mark 1, 35, if you remember, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So notice we're seeing a balance of two storms and two moments where Jesus is going away for prayer. Now, we know that Jesus loved the Father, and he wanted to spend time with the Father. And he probably also understood what was going on with the temptation of the crowd, with also being exhausted from all of the the ministry he had been doing. Um, He needed to go and get strength and encouragement and guidance from his God, from, from, from the Father. And so I think what we see here is just another prime example of how we are to walk in the footsteps of Christ. Just as Christ prioritizes prayer, we too need to find time for private moments of prayer. In fact, I would say personal time with God is the most important thing you will ever do in this life. There are so many things that we can do that are really good, that God wants us to do. We we are to go and make disciples of the nations. We should love people, go to church. We should sing songs of praise. We, we should do all of these things. We do a good job at work, you know, um, love your spouse, love your kids, love your neighbors. All those things are good. But the number one thing that really is the foundation for all of those other things is that quiet time that you have alone with God, that personal, private time that you spend with God in prayer and in devotional reading, reading the scriptures, reading his word. Remember, prayer as we, we talk to him, and also God's word can talk back. Now, of course, God can speak to our inner man through prayer as well as we just sit um, quietly and, and being open to hearing what the Lord is saying to us. But primarily, we know that he will speak to us through his word as well. So we have these opportunities through prayer and scripture reading to be in intimate fellowship with God. And that is the most important thing that we could ever do That's the one thing that we know will always have everlasting significance when we go to heaven. Those moments that we spent with the Lord will always matter to us and to the Lord. But we see that, once again, Christ does this, and we see that it's because he depends on it to get strength and guidance. But what I wanted to draw out from this specifically is that he goes there, and he's praying, and I cannot imagine that he's not also praying for his disciples who he knows is right there in the water. He probably can hear and or even see the storm at some point during the time of prayer. We know, and I'll read it in a second, where we know that he does see them for sure at some point. But we see that he is praying passionately. And I think that he's praying for his disciples just like he's praying for himself. And I think about that then as we come to the series we've been working on in Hebrews, as we hear what Jesus is doing right now, how we are reminded that just like Jesus is right there praying for his disciples in the storm, he too right now is in heaven praying for us, interceding for us. I want to read this again in Hebrews 7, 25. It says, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I just love that. As I, I've studied more and more about his intercession, the intercession of Christ, it just is such a beautiful reality to think that our Lord always lives to make intercession for us so that we can experience salvation and all that comes with salvation to the uttermost, to the full. He wants us to literally understand what it means to be in a relationship with God and to know him. And so he is praying for his disciples here in the storm, and he's also praying for you when you were in the storm. He is praying for your salvation, for your good, for your strength, for your peace. He is praying for these things as we encounter them. 
So we see he's praying, and we see, I think, and I think we can imply he is praying for his disciples. But then in verse 48, we see that he, is, he also sees them. It says, Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed, by them, or passed them by. So we see here, he's on the mountain. They're in the water. It's really just kind of a beautiful picture, I think, of heaven to the earth in, in some ways. To think he is lo- overlooking sees them there, and he cares about them. And so we know that, as I read, we know what he's going to do now. He's going to go to them. But just think about that. He's praying for them. He sees them. He really notices them. And then he's going to go to them. And, but just for the moment, just to think about God seeing you, Christ seeing you. He's aware of your experiences. He's aware of your highs and your lows, your strengths and your suffering. We see that our Lord actually sees, because I know that there's moments that we feel like we're alone, and we feel like Christ is far away. But this, is, I think, is just a beautiful picture for us of how even when we feel like Jesus isn't in the boat with us, he's still right there looking at us, standing up with power, with authority, and he sees us. And then that obviously leads to what I just said, where he then will go to them. And in verses 48 to 51, I think what we are reminded of is that when Christ shows up, there is nothing that can stop him. Nothing can stop Jesus from getting to you. The winds, the waves, the water, none of that is too great to keep Christ from getting to you when you're in trouble. And I think that's just a powerful thing to think about. And, and as I even think about it, as it says in the text, it says um, that Christ came at the fourth watch. Now, this is important because sometimes you're like, well, wait, I feel like it's getting really rough right now, and I feel like Christ is not showing up for me. Well, sometimes Christ will wait to show up until the fourth watch. Once again, that is the, probably the darkest part of the whole night. And that also would have meant that they were rowing for hours. So this probably would have got to the point where they were feeling as, as if all hope was lost. They were exhausted physically, mentally, spiritually at this point, and then Christ shows up. Sometimes we give up because we think there's no way Christ will come, but then he shows up. And I think that this is also a lesson for us that Christ will show up, but sometimes it might be at the fourth watch. Also, I think sometimes we miss Christ when he does show up. He can be right in front of us, and we can miss it. And that's what we see also in the text, because what happens? Jesus shows up at the fourth watch, and the disciples say, it's a ghost. They don't say, it's the Lord. It's God in the flesh. It's the one who provides for all of us. He can do anything. Nothing can stop him. No, they, they, they are fearful, and they think it's a ghost. And there are times, I think, where Christ is right there with us in our suffering, in our struggles, and we're just like, God, where are you? Jesus, why aren't you going to do something for me? And he's already provided you the answer. He's already given you the way out, and we're just like, no, not that way, another way. I think we see this sometimes. The disciples, they didn't see Jesus, and he was right there in front of them. But he wanted them to see him. So we see that sometimes Christ will show up at the fourth watch. Sometimes Christ will be right in front of us and we even miss it. But then as we think about Jesus walking on water itself and what it signifies. See, water is used often in the Bible as well as many other um, works of, of, of literature to describe chaos and the, the, the problems of this world or the, the concerns or the cares of the world. So if we were to take it on a literary, uh, in a literary way, just to think, what does that mean? He is above all the chaos and all the cares that we have. He is above it. He is, has dominion, has authority over these things. And in fact, not only is he greater than the chaos or the challenges of life, we see that there are biblical accounts in the Old Testament that says the only person who has authority like that is God himself. In Job chapter 9, 
Verse 8, it says, He alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. That is Job talking about the Lord, talking about Yahweh. Only God can spread out the heavens and tread or walk on the waves of the sea. Likewise, in Isaiah 43, 16, it says, Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters. See, our God walks on water, and our God can always make a way through the waters of life. And I think that's just so powerful because I think that's what Jesus is trying to show them and teach them because they didn't get it already. He is God. Jesus is above all things because he is the creator, sustainer of all things. And if it's not clear enough there, we then see what he says to them. Of course, he tells them to be of good cheer and to not fear, which that to me shows us that he is also saying, hey, I am able to dispel your greatest fears and anxieties. Do you have fear and anxiety in your life? Jesus is saying, don't fear. Why? Because he says, it is I. You might be like, okay, it is I. What is so significant about that? Well, in the Greek, that is ego I me. That is the Greek version of the Hebrew name that we see for God in Exodus 3.14. Many of you know the burning bush account where Moses is like, who should I say you are? Who, who should I say is sending me? Well, Exodus 3.14 says, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Those are the words that Jesus is speaking to them. He's saying, not only is it me, Jesus, but he's actually saying, ego, I me, I am. And we actually know that in the other gospels, there are these I am statements where he says, ego, I me, and he's using God's covenant name. And he says, um, before Abraham was, I am, was ego, I me. So we see that Jesus is saying, look who I am. Realize it is God who is with you. What do you have to be afraid of? I am above it all. You can rest in me. So we see then how Christ is the answer to all of our problems, all of our struggles. And in fact, I think it's a beautiful um, comparison and demonstration for us of the gospel itself. Just remember for a moment, what were the disciples doing before Jesus got there? It says that they were straining and rowing and they weren't getting anywhere. I think to myself, that's what it's like before Christ comes into our lives. We're grinding. We're straining. We're trying to get to heaven through our, our righteous deeds that are really just filthy rags. We can't work our way to heaven. We're just going to keep working and working and we're never going to get there. But then you have Christ and he's able to walk above it all. And he says, if you have faith in me, you can rise. You can walk, and I'm going to get you to the other side. I think that that's a beautiful way for us to see the gospel here, is that when we, when we truly see that Jesus is who he says he is, we can do amazing things, and we find that he is the one who can get us to that other side. So we see that obe or, uh, obedience can be uncomfortable at times. We see Jesus prays for us, sees us, and shows up for us. But the last thing that we see is that, is that warning in verse 52. And I think what we see in that warning is that hard hearts can miss out on the work of God. Hard hearts can miss out on the work of God. See, they literally had the opportunity to learn from that first miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. They would have been able to see he is the provider. He is God in the flesh. But instead, they weren't receptive. They weren't really paying attention. They were thinking probably earthly. They were thinking very physical. Um, they were thinking in the moment, right? But they weren't thinking about who is this truly? What does this really mean theologically, spiritually? What is God showing us here? Because once again, in verse 52, it says, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. And I think that this is a humble reminder for us that even followers of Christ can harden their hearts if they're not paying attention. If you're not listening to his word, if you're not looking in your day-to-day -day life and saying, God, what are you showing me? Where are you calling me? Why did I go through this? Am I trying to learn through the storm or I'm just complaining about the discomfort? 
Am I seeing Jesus as the person who is praying for me, sees me in my suffering, and is the one that will and does and has shown up for me? If we fail to see how good God has been in the past, you're going to miss out on what he's doing in the future. And I think that's the clear warning for us here because, once again, they had hardened their hearts. They had done a lot of good, but ultimately they were missing out on who Jesus was in their life because they weren't paying attention. So I think this is another, once again, reminder for us, let us pay close attention to God's word, to the Spirit's leading, and to all of the provisional um, works that he's doing in our day-to-day lives. 